lost today, I guess we'll say, um, is, is terrific. Really, really great university. I loved every second there. So while I was there, I had an opportunity to play on the football team, which was always a dream come true of mine since I was a kid. We had, I was involved in student government, Greek life. I just wanted to get involved with everything that I possibly could uh, because when ultimately that's what's going to increase the experience. And, and, and when you go for an interview or you go for a job interview, all the experience and all the folks you meet, that really what sets you apart. Uh, so in class, I had Professor Betts for all of my finance classes, really enjoyed my time with Professor Betts to maximize shareholder wealth. That's uh, still, that's still uh, important of mine. And, and even a little story, I probably should have told Professor Betts when it happened, but in an interview, uh, one of the managing directors were very impressed that I knew that Janet Yellen was the head of the Federal Reserve. So from our class, he was very impressed. Not a lot of folks knew that, and I knew that. So thank you for, for, for pressing that on. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so, so the academics were, were super important. And for me, from an early point, it was I wanted to make sure to do as well as possible in my grades. Um, starting freshman year, I knew pretty much I knew from that I, when I was a kid that I wanted to work at a bank. A, a big American bank was where I wanted to start my career from when I was in elementary school. The way a bank operates, you walk in. Um, teller there, bankers, trillions and trillions of dollars going through on a millisecond it was always super fascinating to me and I needed to learn more. So every single decision I made from the second I stepped foot on campus from orientation through I crossed that stage at MetLife Stadium was done to be to get put in the banking industry. Uh, so freshman year, my main goal was I wanted to get involved in campus, do really well in my school work try and read the journal and learn as much as possible because you really can't get an internship freshman year. It just, there's just not a possibility for that typically. I mean, as long as when I was there. Uh, so freshman year, it was just a matter of making connections, learning as much as possible and, and doing well in school, uh, doing well in all my classes. It's very important to do well in your classes. If you have a strong GPA, you can put that on your resume and it shows that you take your education very seriously. And how you, I've always felt that how you do anything is how you do everything. So doing well in school is incredibly important to me and, and to all my bosses too. That's always a question that they ask and we ask in interviews is how do you do in school? It's important to do well. So that was my freshman year goal. Now going into sophomore year, my goals were the same. I wanted to do well in school, keep making networks, grow my professional brand. And I wanted to do everything I could to get an internship. So this is where Mary can attest that I lived in her office in the basement of the mansion. Not sure if her office is still in the mansion, in the basement. It is. Not in the basement anymore. All right. So hopefully Mary got a window. We moved up. We're front and center. As soon as you walk Nice. In, nice. So hopefully, hopefully you have a nice window. I always want. Uh, so sophomore year for me was keep doing well in school, learning as much as possible, and doing everything in my power to build up that resume. Uh, so for me, I lived in Mary's office at least once or twice a week saying, hello, any, anything I can do to help? Is there any opportunities yet? And there was a PDP event uh, in the mansion, and, and I met a really successful executive at MetLife Solutions Group, and she gave me an opportunity to interview for an opening on her, on her team as a sophomore, which, looking back, was an incredible experience, and without Mary's help and putting the event together, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, so at that event, the, um, I met the individual, went to go interview, and they offered me a spot on their team to look uh, with, with an advisor. It was a credible experience. Got to put a suit and tie on, drive to work every day, and help the advisor in any way possible that he needed, whether it was uh, calling clients, which was a little bit of a daunting task at 19 years old, but looking back it is invaluable to me today. Uh, looking over the portfolio of, of the different clients and how could we help meet their goals a little bit better. So that was a really good internship. I was there sophomore year, really enjoyed it. Uh, but now I wanted more of an experience, hopefully at a bank, if not, wherever I would get that other experience. And I met Bill Sharon. I'm not sure if anyone in here has ever met Bill. Bill is one of the kindest, most intelligent individuals I've ever met in my entire life. Not just career, in my entire life. Uh, and he offered me a spot on his team in Merrill Lynch across the street. And I learned a ton from their team on how to research stocks, different ratios to look into, once again, answering the phones, 
uh, for all of their high net worth individuals was a really, really good experience. And a little side note, um, Merrill, where I ultimately started my career, I'll, I'll get there later on, um, you, they don't contribute to the retirement until you've been there a year. But my three months with Merrill as an intern helped. So they, they started contributing to the retirement uh, right away. Which, a uh, side note, I didn't necessarily put this in my notes, but when you do start the career, make sure to match whatever the retirement is. There's not many things in life that are free. That's free. So remember that hopefully whenever you fill out your paperwork in a few years to, to, max, to max that retirement. So that was sophomore year. Really good opportunity. Uh, Merrill Lynch across the street, a beautiful building. Great, great opportunity. But I still wanted to just take on whatever experience could possibly come up. I, for me, I didn't really care what I was doing as an intern. I just wanted to learn whatever possible. Uh, so again, at a PDP event, so happy that thanks to, to Mary's very hard work, another PDP event, I met uh, one of the executives at the ACO company, which is a subsidiary of Bowman. They were right, they were right, in a, right by campus in Parsippany. So I was able to do a couple hours a week during the semester there. Learn more over there. We, what the company does is they're essentially advisors for executives at the Fortune 1000 company. So for me, I got to on a daily basis talk to executives in Boeing and Verizon and other very senior companies just to talk to them to see uh, are we helping you meet your goals? Are there, are there the accounts set up in the correct way? Uh, is the insurance the right amount of insurance? Whatever the advisor needed, I helped with that. And, and I learned a ton that way. And even in my personal life, I still use a lot of what I learned there. So it was an incredible experience. Uh, but now all up to this point, a lot of my internships are more on the advisory side, which is a really interesting part of the industry. But I did want a little bit more experience on the corporate side of the house. Uh, so very, very lucky. Another email came through Mary's desk about an opportunity at J.P. Morgan Chase. And kind of funny to look back now in the header, it said Rutgers students only. So I graduated from Fairleigh Dickinson. I did not go to Rutgers. Uh, but Mary reached out to the contact that we had and he said, no, they only just put that, really just it was a stale job rec. But that kind of goes to show that you, you have nothing to lose by applying to anything. Uh, even if it's something that you don't necessarily know you'd be a perfect fit for, or if you think they might pick you, you have absolutely nothing to lose by going, meeting individuals, interviewing, so that's definitely something I could always recommend and advise of you guys. Uh, so I went on the interview. I did great. Uh, they offered me a spot within their business banking department, which for me was always a really interesting area. My father owned a small business, still does. And this, this group of bankers and, and back office folks help small businesses, which truly are, as we learned over the last year in this crazy COVID times, the backbone of this amazing country. Yeah, so there I got to look over the financials of companies, see what they need. Does a company need more debt? Does a company need a larger credit line? What do they need? How can we help be of service to those individuals? Uh, I got really into the Excel side of the house, which was incredibly important. And I can't stress to you guys enough how important doing well in your Excel class is. So kind of back to what Professor Betts said, uh, the MIS, I had Professor Shu. I'm not sure if he's still there, but that was one of the most important classes, if not the most important class I took while on campus, because I spend roughly 10 to 11 hours a day in Excel, and you need a very strong Excel base. Even now, when I interview folks, the first question I ask is, what's your favorite Excel shortcut? Just to see if people know how to use Excel, because it's so important in the industry. And one thing that I wish I would have known a little more of, I don't know, is macros and VBA. So I don't know if, if they're offering that to you guys, but if you have downtime, I highly recommend learning that and asking your computer science teachers for that. Because if you know macros and you could simplify a process, that is incredibly important in the industry today. Uh, so after my internship at JP Morgan, they offered me a spot to start full time in their company, which was a dream come true since I was a kid starting at JP Morgan Chase. This is a great a dream come true. All of my hard work has paid off. Um, except about a month, uh, I guess about a month earlier, I had an opportunity to interview for Bank of America in their, one of their rotational programs. It's called the FMAP program. And it's actually one of the best rotational programs on the entire street. You do an internship and then two one-year rotations back to back. So essentially through two and a half years, you have three different experiences, which is unheard of. 
So I interviewed there. They flew me to Charlotte, which looking back was pretty cool as a, uh, I guess at the time a senior in college getting flown down uh, on the company dollar. They're taking us to dinner, food, a beautiful view of the city and the top floor of the Charlotte headquarter building. Incredible experience. I, I thought I did very well, but they went in a different direction. And I sent an email to all of the directors that I interviewed with just to thank you very much. I had a great fit. I, I really liked the company, but they went in a different direction. And this, I'm sure your professors in there has always told you it's crucially important to send a thank you note after every interview. But had I not done that, I can say with 100% certainty, I'm not where I am today because on the interview, uh, on, on that email rather, uh, one of the directors came back and said, let's stay in touch in the next couple of months I may have an opening on my team. And that's what I did. I ultimately started on his team because of the interview and because of that thank you note. So another lesson is always, always, always send a thank you note. It shows you really care about the position and that it's important to you. Uh, so that's where I started. It was, I was started in the equities business of Bank of America. Uh, what we did there was we looked over the balance sheet. We looked over the profit and loss income statement. Uh, I like to describe what I do because it's sometimes a little difficult to describe to folks is we're the financial conscience of the bank. Every decision that bank makes has to come through us. Are we growing? And our Bank of America CEO always says in a controlled focus. It's very easy to grow when you don't care about who you're issuing debt to and, and what other mistakes you could be making, but are we growing in a controlled setting? And that was what we really did. I really loved my time in the equities department, but I, I did a great job. Um, the senior folks really liked me. And they said, do you want to go learn the municipal banking and markets area? Uh, which I thought was interesting. I said, of course, well, I'd love to learn. And what, what we did in the municipal banking and markets area is essentially the way that I have a checking account with Chase the city of New York, the city of Madison, all these cities and municipalities, they need those services as well. So that's what that area was. They were essentially all the, the municipalities. We looked, we helped them with whatever their goals were. So the one area that I worked very specifically was the, we were more the, the derivative business. So essentially the state of, as I'm sure Professor Betts tells you, the state of New Jersey issues a loan and pays a 5% coupon. But the state of New Jersey is only doing that because they need to raise capital. They're not in the business of taking on interest rate risk. They can't take that risk on. They don't have the proper avenues to hedge that risk. They don't want to do that. So that's where we come in and we'll essentially pay them a 5% coupon on whatever that is. So they're net flat and we'll take the other end of it, kind of hedge that out and, and really just make a profit on the spread. So that was my business that I looked over in the municipal bank and markets area. And one of the most important functions that I had was what we call price verification. You'll hear about it as IPV. And the way I like to describe that is what, in the equities business, if you're looking at an Apple, I own an Apple stock, we could check today what the price is on Bloomberg and it's 130 or so, around 130. There's really not much uncertainty to the value of that asset. But now let me ask you, how do you think you come up with the value of something that's not publicly traded and that there's no listed price for? In, in banks and, and pre-recession, this got Lehman in a lot of trouble, is there's actually no way to really prove what it's worth. If I say an asset's worth $10, how do you prove it's worth $10? So then you're marking your balance sheet to that $10, you're taking in the profit based off you owning an asset that's worth $10. And it's a very dangerous thing if that's not actually correct and you wanna lie. People, some companies sometimes, as with Lehman and other companies, sometimes are greedy and lie. And so this function is called price verification, where essentially all of the banks on the street will send that owns that asset. So whatever it is, all of the banks on the street come back and say it's worth an average of $10, whether it's nine, 11, 12, 13, come up with an average of 10. If we marked it at eight or nine or 11, we're pretty close to mark. We're doing all of our controls are correct. We're not being greedy, we're correct. But what happens? happens if we mark that asset at 100 or 200 or 1,000? That means that we're either lying, which is possible, or we have an, a control break. So that was the function that I looked over a lot in the price testing area. Uh, loved my time in municipal banking markets. I was doing well. I got promoted. My managers really liked me. I was never looking to leave the bank. 
I really like Bank of America, but I got an, an opportunity to interview at Mizuho, which is the second biggest Japanese bank in the world. I'm sorry, in Japan. And I took the interview. I had nothing to lose. It was in this exact spot. I wore a shirt and sat in my kitchen. So I had no reason not to. And I went there and everything they said, I really loved. It was a smaller company. Today on a daily basis, I talk with the treasurer of the entire American side of the company, which is incredible to think about. And I really enjoy my time there, uh, learning a ton, helping out a lot. And that's kind of where I'm at today. So I guess I could stop here if there's any other questions. Um, I think this is a decent place to stop. If anyone has questions, you can type them in the chat or you can request to be promoted and you can ask Anthony live yourself. Just let me know. Either the chat or Q&A. Yeah, whatever, uh, whatever's best for you guys. I, like I said, I love questions. So I hope, um, I hope you guys have some good ones. We have a shy group of people here today, I guess, Anthony. Um, it looks like Brian has raised his hand. I'm not sure if that's a question or- Oh, Brian has raised his hand, yes. And Casey could ask a question. All right, let's promote Brian to a panelist and bring him up here and then I'm gonna bring Casey up. All right. Hey, Brian, you are live. Hi, Anthony. Um, thanks for coming to speak today. I'm a finance student and I just have, I just want to know more about like skills that you think would be a crucial advancing, like in finance, um, like this summer I'm doing operations and looking forward to that, but I just want to hear about like more of the skills that helped you get into banking, like what I should know. Definitely. So most important, um, absolutely most important is your Excel skills. If you're in operations, you'll be spending probably 90 to 95% of your day in Excel. Um, I had a strong basis from some of my classes, but there's so much more to learn. I would even just spend some time looking up YouTube shortcuts. It's super important to have shortcuts on that. Um, definitely, you want to be well versed in the industry of kind of current events. Uh, I remember John Budish one time asked us that. Actually, I was in Professor Betts's class. We had a, a little um, it's kind of session like this, but with John Budish, and he wanted to know what the U.S. Treasury was at. I didn't even I had no idea, absolutely no idea. But I got embarrassed in that class. And I promised that forever, I would know exactly what the treasury is at. And it may come up, it may not, but you wanna know what's going on. You have to know what the Dow is going at. It's, it comes up, what, what's the Dow trading at? Or things like that. If you're working for a company, um, you wanna make sure you know who the leadership board is. It's, I was at Merrill Lynch and I didn't know I was talking, to, I was in the elevator with the COO of the entire bank. Just luckily I was dressed right. I had my hair done, I was shaved, but you never know, you wanna know who folks are. And, and those are all really important things and go there. And I think the biggest thing that you'll notice is I was at Bank of America, the biggest bank in the world. I, we had networking events with the CEO, the CFO, CFO. People want to help you ask questions and always do a great job. I guess say how you do anything is how you do everything. So no task that you could be given is, is too small. Whatever you do own to the best of your ability and always try and make anything a better than your bet leave everything better than you found it is, is another thing but congratulations that's a that's a really great thing what uh, what firm will you be at in operations uh prudential in the pigeon department oh nice nice yeah. very nice okay i have another question too so you mentioned that you had um like in some interviews like one of the things you mentioned was favorite excel shortcut what are some of like the ice maybe tougher questions or like unexpected ones that like uh you encountered on your way up like through all these different positions and banks so my toughest question that I ever got, and I didn't get the internship probably because I didn't answer this question very well, um, was at J I was interviewing at JP Morgan and they essentially, and I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was, I was just all prepared because I lived in Mary's office. I was super prepared for every question you could possibly throw at me. So I knew a time that I improved the situation. All those character traits are super important. But one, one of the questions at JP Morgan was you essentially have a ball and a bat and the, the price is $3. The ball is two, two times more the value of the bat. I don't remember the exact specifics of it, but that was a tough one. It's just kind of, cause I was all prepared for, for all of these character questions or whatever that could be. 
that one kind of got got me a little bit. So that was one of the hardest ones I ever got. And if you ever, if anyone ever asks you any kind of what's what's an Excel shortcut, always say pivot tables or V lookups, H lookups, anything like that, because I live in pivot tables. Sometimes I'll have millions of rows of data, and a pivot table is an incredibly easy way to make sense of large data. So those are some of the questions that I had in interviews. Thank you. Awesome. Casey, you're up next. Turn your camera on. You're Thank still, you, you're on. How you doing, Anthony? Hey, Casey. Happy to have you. Thank you for coming. So my question is kind of different. I'm a mechanical engineering major. So I've been trying for two years now to get into the investment side, but um, I've been declined two years straight by Bank of America and JP Morgan. But this year, uh, I got to the final round. For, I, got, I got to the final round for JP Morgan. So I'm just curious to know, like, what should I like do, like, to expect when I when they get back to me? You know, because you know, being an engineering major, on paper, I don't have experience, but I've been in the market for three years with real estate and stocks, so I am familiar with how it works. But just on physical paper, I don't have any experience. It's just strictly engineering background, so it's just been really hard with COVID as well, too. You know, it's made everything a lot tougher, so. What advice would you really give for an engineering major trying to get into the investment side? Yeah, so I think the, the one thing that, um, that I learned is what you learn in class is incredibly important, but there was a, I remember we spent two full three hour classes on a, this valuation of a firm. And now I get that email to my computer every morning at 5 a.m. So it's a lot of what you learn in school is incredibly important and in how you go about learning it. But once you get into the real world, a lot of that stuff is really given to you. So you're not necessarily missing out on, on a lot of what you can learn. But when you get to that interview, being able that you're well-versed, you understand um, really how the markets work, what makes the different company, if you're a JP, what makes JP tick, it's incredibly important that you know uh, kind of current events going on. We, if it's depending on when the interview is, they may have just released their financials. So if you talk to that, it shows that you learned, you cared about it and took enough time to really learn it. Uh, and that's really what I would say is when you get to that interview, show that it's important to you, that you really like what you're doing and that you're interested in making it a better place. That's re that's right. When I interview folks and you need to be passionate. If, if I sometimes work 60, 70, 80 hours a week, if I'm not happy doing what I'm doing, people are going to burn out really, really fast. So it's important to show that you're very happy with what you do. You're passionate. And most importantly, you can make it a better place to be. Okay. Thank you so much for that. I have one more and question. What, uh, what area of JP is that, is that position with? I maybe, maybe maybe some folks over there. Um, I can get you the exact name for it. I'll uh, give me a second, please. Yeah, I'll put, I mean, I'll, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my email in, in the chat feel free to email me anything, legitimately anything. Yeah. I'm very, very happy to help in any way possible. So if you have a, if you do have the interview, um, if you know, if you know your interviewer, I can look him or her up on LinkedIn. It's really funny how the banking industry is so massive, but yet so small. I, <laughs> when I was interviewing to leave Bank of America, it's a little awkward because it's people you're leaving, but you want to leave on great terms. I did. I left on great terms, but you can't really let anyone know you're interviewing because that's a little bit of an awkward thing. And it just so happened that the, the managing director that runs my group at Mizuho is best friends with probably my closest mentor at Bank of America. They got lunch at least twice or three times a year. They were best friends. They started at Merrill 25 years ago together. So I told him that I'm interviewing with this gentleman. He called him right away and I had the offer on my desk about an hour later. So it's funny how much of a small world it is. So I put my email in there. Please email me with anything. I'm more than happy to jump on a call, help mentor any way possible because I'm really passionate about that. And I really, I really mean that. So I put my email in there. Please email with any questions you have. Thank you so much. Uh, the position is a 2021 corporate analyst development program, summer analyst. And then the second one is a, um, it is a, where is it, where is it? It's another summer analyst position for JP Morgan. I got to the final round for both uh, positions. The interview I thought would be like maybe in person, but it actually was virtually. So it was a virtual interview where, you know, there are time responses for each question and I recorded myself and then sent it to them. So 
they said that this month they're actually going to be um getting back to applicants to know they got the position or not. I have a, a guy who has a friend that's in JP Morgan that like looked into my profile and he said that it looks pretty good, but just to be more patient because they have a lot of applications. So it's kind of just been at that, to be honest. No, well, well good, but even getting the interview is is something you should be very proud of. So pat yourself on the back. That means that you everything you've done to this point, you've done right. So you should be proud of that. Um, I'm confident you'll do well on there. But like I said, if you have any questions or anything that I can help out with, please let me know. Thank you so much, will do. Casey, did you have another question? Yeah, one more question. Yeah, please. I'm still trying to figure out, you know, since you have a lot of an issue in the bank and what banking, how does how do big banks feel about cryptocurrency? You know, because whenever that topic comes up comes upon, I'm not sure how like I don't want to say too much about it. I'm not sure if banks are against it or for it. You know, things are changing. So in your opinion, how are big banks starting to incorporate? How do they feel about cryptocurrency? Is it a big or bad thing? It's it's funny because up until up until last week when Tesla bought a billion and a half dollars of, of Bitcoin, banking didn't really have much overlap with, with crypto. It's it's kind of tough because in, in what I've seen is the banking industry is so heavily regulated. Every They're all so scared about reputational risk. And with crypto, the, the fear that I've seen and, and when I've heard other folks speak is really the intentions of why why do you need to buy something essentially with this cryptocurrency when Bank of America has dozens of options that you could buy through Zelle or whatever it is. So I think now with Tesla making this large investment in Bitcoin, it kind of legitimizes it a little bit, but the banking industry is still a little bit slower to adapt to newer things at times. So we, we haven't, I mean, at Merrill and even now at Mizuho, there hasn't really been much interaction with with cryptocurrency, I think at some point it could possibly be, but I haven't seen that first yet. And they're definitely, banks aren't always, I could say that with quite certainty, they're never the first thing into an industry like that, just because they're so scared of reputational risk or, or anything like that. So that's kind of what I, I haven't necessarily seen it yet, but I'm not sure exactly where it'll go, but it'd be interesting to see. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Um, I think Mark, you're up next. Do you have a question? So if you want to turn your camera on. Yeah, I have a question. Hey, Mark. So uh, I'm a finance major also. And um, in the summer, I'll be working at Wells Fargo through the equity capital markets program. And um, I just had a question. Like you said before, you work about 80 hours a week. So I just want to know what tips can you provide me um, to stay productive while working long hours and to pay attention throughout the day? Yeah. So, and, and for me, it's not often it's for us. If, if I put that on, I apologize. It's we, it's not every week, but it's at times it has, it does come up. And for me, I would say the most important thing is definitely some exercise. So for me, it's now working remote is a little bit different because previously when I would get on the subway and come home, my day ended at that point. Now I haven't done a great job of kind of mixing when work ends and when my regular life starts is kind of all mixed into one at this point. Um, so I would say definitely you're starting. That's incredible. You should be very proud of yourself, but it's probably going to be remote. I would say, right. Cause I don't, or did they tell you it's going to be remote? Well, they didn't tell us yet, but I'm going to assume it's remote. Yeah. I would say definitely for me, I start every morning. I get up, I, I do an hour on the treadmill. I get some exercise. It's uh, important to kind of eat. It sounds cliche, but but exercise, eating healthy, th those are the parts that really keep your mind fresh and, and really have to be involved, interested in what you're doing because uh, if it's late and I don't really care about what I'm doing, it, it gets a little bit more tough. So that's it. I would say definitely take time. Even today, it, it might be a little bit late at night, but I'm going to take a little bit of time and, and go on a treadmill for 10, 20 minutes. Just take, take a break. You come back, you're refreshed. Um, that's really my big advice is make sure to don't forget to, to take care of yourself because you work for a company, but most importantly, it's your own health and mental and physical health. So make sure to, to take care of yourself as well. It's super important. Thank you. That's great advice, Anthony. I totally agree. 100%. Very good. Um, anybody else have any other questions?
Uh, Anthony, I, I have a question for you. How are job opportunities now for college graduates? What's your what are your what's your company doing? Uh, you know, coming up for uh, you know this graduating class or even going forward, uh, are, are are opportunities there? Are they cutting back? What's going on? So I think right now the problem is is no one knows where we're going to be. So this time last year. I remember I went home on March 12th for work. I told my boss I'd be in April 1st. I actually thought 2020. Um, it seems maybe 2022 is a better guess of April. Uh, so I think they, no one knows on what the future state of the industry is really going to be. Are we going to go back the way it used to be where I sat a foot and a half from my colleague on my left and a foot and a half on my right? Is that how it's going to be? Maybe, maybe not. No one knows. So I think for right now, we're still going through with a full summer internship program. It's fully remote. Absolutely 100% fully remote. Um, I, so I think that's how we're going to be today. But I think as this shakes over and we see what the total future state is, I think that's when we'll know better of are, we, are they having, does it matter where you live? Can you live in in Texas, can you live in, in Oklahoma? Can you live in the UK? I think a lot of that is, as we'll see as this kind of unfolds, because I know me personally and a lot of folks, this is going on a lot longer than most people thought. And one good thing I, I do have to see is um, at Merrill at times, if a job was, was left, they wouldn't necessarily replace it right away. At this new comp at Mizuho, we someone left, and funny enough, my best friend at Merrill will be starting next week. So they are still growing uh, in the new, or at least keeping the same headcount in the New York office. But that is a very valid question, and I don't think anybody knows of what tomorrow's state is. It, it's definitely interesting to see. All right, thank you. Absolutely, Emma has a question. Emma, can Hi, you? Emma. Hi, Anthony. Come in. Thank you for coming to speak today. My name is Emma. I'm actually an accounting major with a wealth management minor. Oh, um, and something that gets promoted to the accounting majors all the time is data automation. And I know you keep speaking about Excel and how important Excel is, but I mean, like for accounting majors in specific, they almost tell us that Excel is not enough to know. You need to know more advanced platforms. So I guess my question to you is what else do you recommend besides Excel when it comes to data processing and data automation? Yeah, that, so that's very true. And, and when I was at Merrill, we, we put a major emphasis. It was hundreds of millions of dollars into, I don't even know if you guys heard of it, but it's all tricks was, was a really big program. I, every time wanted to learn about it, but you had to have, you had to know how to use it to get the software because software is very expensive. And when I said, Oh, great. Can I get the software? They told me no. So it was kind of hard to learn this. So I would say all of those, if you know, they, they offer all tricks, there's a couple others that, that slipped my mind, but those next level, if you could learn those or even know what they do, or even if you could just know they exist in an interview, it makes you automatically look like you've been doing your research and know what they are. I personally am not a good example because I've never used those software and I don't know, but but you're being told absolutely right is Excel is what, what people do in Excel today that could take an hour. There's programs that can do it in a hundredth of a millisecond but they're very expensive programs. They're very difficult to master. But if you learn them, you're incredibly valuable. So I would definitely look up what those are. And if you can know any kind of macros within Excel, that's incredibly important. But, but they're definitely right. Excel, there's a chance Excel is obsolete in three or four or five years due to these other programs. So even just researching what they are and, and understanding what they do. And if you can learn how they, I'm sure there's YouTube videos that you could at least know what they are would make you seem very, very well-versed and give you a good leg up in the competition or an interview. So that's very, very good advice. I agree to that. Absolutely, yeah, thank you. I'm actually working on my Altrix uh, designer certification now. So they do offer like free student memberships in addition to I'm learning Tableau as well. So those are like two big programs that my internship pushes on me. Um, so I just wanted to know if there's any other ones that you thought were important for your, obviously this is accounting specific and I'm a tax intern, so this is tax specific technology. But if there was anything else for you in terms of banking and more finance-based platforms and programs. Yeah, those two, that, that's right. The, the, the second one, it slipped my mind because when I was at Merrill, that was always, they were pushing that at the new company. Our, bud, our tech budget's roughly about probably one millionth of what the tech budget was at Merrill. So Merrill would spend like, 
tens of billions of dollars on tech every single year. Uh, and those softwares so are incredibly important. If you could learn all tricks and you could bring that, you could, there's really no company that you couldn't go to. Whether you want to stay in tax accounting, you want to go to the banking industry, you want to go to hedge funds, anything in the world. If you know how to do that, you put an immense leg up on the competition, including me. You'd get something over me because I don't know how those softwares work. So if you could learn that, that's incredible. And I, I highly recommend that. Great Thank question. you. Great question, Emma, and great advice. Yeah, really good question. Really good question. Anybody else? Last chance, questions, comments, anything? Professor Betts? Yeah, this might be a little bit more uncomfortable for Anthony, but what kind of salaries are out there for the different jobs and positions? And are they going up, going down, not changing? Do you know? Yeah. So I love uncomfortable questions. For me, I hate that the industry, you don't talk salary, you know, because you have no idea um, what people are. So I started at Merrill in the rotational program. Like I said, the program at Merrill was one of the most competitive on the street. And they started me at 78 out of school, which at the time I thought was, was, was pretty competitive. Um, what I have seen is the salaries kind of stayed a little bit flat. Uh, I remember, and kind of funny story, I'll, I'll talk on this. So when, when I was in, you guys are, seem like you, you know more about the industry than I did, but when I was going on interviews, all I knew about is I knew sales and trading and I knew investment banking. And I would tell folks that I wanted to do that. And when they would ask why, I didn't really have a reason. My reason was, I saw that they made a lot of money in movies and they wore cool suits. And I thought that was pretty neat. Um, so for, for me, the fact that you guys are going for interviews and, and have an idea of what, what's out there, you're even better off than I was in your exact spot five, six years ago. Um, but the salaries is definitely what I've seen at Merrill was Merrill would start a little higher than probably most of the street. And then you would top, you would kind of top out at that point and get your two, three, four percent year after year. The, I think the $100,000, $200,000 bonuses are probably a thing of the past. A lot, uh, the, the thing that I've found was in the 80s and 90s from my research that companies didn't really care about expenses because the bottom line was, was growing so, so fast. But in today's market with all the regulations, it's a little bit more difficult to make money in the top, the top of the line. So what companies have been doing was kind of shrink the bottom line a little bit, cut expenses where possible. So that's kind of what I've seen is that the salaries have stayed somewhat flat. I don't think we're going to go backwards to the 100, 200, 300 thousand dollar bonuses unless you're directly in revenue producing and the bankers and traders. Some of those folks are. It's a lot more commission based. So it also depends on where you are. I'm ultimately an expense to the firm, not a revenue generator. So I don't think I'll ever see those those big time bonuses. How is the mobility once you're in these, do you, do you get into a certain track or is it easy to move between different uh, areas of the, the company? So that's an amazing question. So I think it was just because my dad started a company and worked there his entire life. My uncle started at ExxonMobil, worked there for 40 years, retired. They gave him a, a nice Movado watch on the way out. That's kind of what I thought. I thought you go one place, you work there 40 years and then you go home and you're done. Uh, what I've seen today is, Companies don't want you to be in one spot for too long. They want you to move around. The mobility is incredibly pushed. So when I was at Merrill, a year or two in a row, they wanted you to get some new experiences, learn new things. So mobility is incredibly important. They want you to move within your department. So I moved from equities to uh, the municipal banking and then markets business. But folks also moved from the front office to finance. They moved from audit to finance. They moved... The mobility is, is so important. And what I've seen is because if, if you have experience in the company, you know the, the, the culture, you know the lingo, you know the, the operating systems. So it's easier for them to, to train someone internally than to find someone externally. And it's also more expensive usually for them to find someone externally because they have to give you a reason to leave. So the mobility in these companies is incredible. And I think that'll only increase as we see how working remote is because previously you were, so, I was never going to move. I was born and raised in New York, Brooklyn. I was always going to stay in the Northeast. So New York was the only city I cared about, but bank of America has an incredible office down in Charlotte. It's the headquarters, a ton of great opportunities there. 
They have some great offices in Brazil, in the UK, in France, all over the world. And I think what I would be interested to see is as we continue working remote, are you now given opportunities that would never previously been there? So I think mobility in these companies is probably one of the best things they offer. Absolutely a great question. Good, thank you. What's next, Anthony? So for me, I, I just got here uh, in October, I switched firms and I really like it. It's, uh, so for me, I hope, I'm hoping to stay here, kind of cl climb the ranks a little bit at, at Mizuho um, and, and kind of see what's out there. But I would never turn down an opportunity to interview and, and just see what else is out there. It's, it's funny, I, I kind of hinted to it a little bit earlier. We, we always know a little bit less than we think we do. And for me, I was at Bank of America and I got an opportunity to interview at Mizuho which I wasn't really all that excited to take because Bank of America is the biggest balance sheet bank in the world. And I'm going to go to a company, the fraction of the size, but I figured what do I have to lose of going for an interview? And I loved it. Everything they said was great. So you never know. Um, you never really know what's out there. So I absolutely would take an interview or kind of see what else is out there. But for right now, I'm, I'm just going to kind of keep my head down and keep doing a great job. Uh, at Mizuho. And I see a question, uh, how do we get Mizuho to consider FDU as a target recruiting school? That's a really good question. Really, really good question. And, and for me, I only got here uh, four months ago, so I don't know what our recruiting practices are at this point. But as, I, as I'm here next year, with, we definitely have internships. I don't know how many. I'll, I'll find out. Uh, but that's absolutely something that I'll bring up to my boss is that Folks at FDU are very strong students. How do we, uh, how do we get involved and, and get some resumes for that? So at this point, I don't know how they are because uh, I've only been here for four months. But this time next year, I hope that I'm able to get some interviews, so, some resumes in front of our our directors and managing directors because that, that's a really important thing. It's important to me, and hopefully important to the company as well. That's great. Um, Arjan has a question. Yeah, oh. <laughs> please, please connect on LinkedIn. Uh, absolutely. I, I I love connecting on LinkedIn. Um, like I said, I put my, my email in there. I Sometimes people say that, but they don't mean it. Please uh, send me an email. I'm more than happy to jump on a call. I'm working remote. It's a lot easier to do things like this than if I was in the city. So you have my email. Add me on LinkedIn. Any question that I possibly can answer, uh, even if it's something you don't feel comfortable asking in a larger audience like this, we could jump on a call and, and you could ask me anything. So I'm definitely happy to help anywhere possible. That's great. Anthony, thank you so much. I mean, you have such a terrific job and career and you're so young and you're already giving back and trying to help our students. So that's just incredible. That's well, so I always felt that I know that I'm not here. I'm not where I am today without the help from you, Mary, with, with Professor Betts, Mark and other FTU alumni. So it, for me, it's, it's incredibly important to, to kind of give back. And I just ask of you guys that at some point when you're in the spot that I am, keep coming back because that's how we keep making FTU a great place because I loved every second there. I hope you guys are loving your time there as well. And I was, we can continue to just keep making it a great place. That's awesome. Jim, do, I see a a uh, do you think playing a college sport helped you get a job and work better as a team? Absolutely. It's, I think the biggest thing and, and where I've always excelled is there are people that are, could potentially be smarter than me or better in Excel or better, but where I strive is no task is too small. I still, to, I've been working four and a half years. I've never told anybody no, which is a good thing, but sometimes a bad thing because people take advantage of it. But uh, just learning how to help any way possible. I definitely learned from football. It was, uh, we were probably one of the worst teams in the entire country when I was there. I went three and 27 in my three years. So, so it was important to, to do whatever was asked of us. And um, so I think definitely helping a sport, being involved in Greek life definitely helped. I would say any leadership experience you can go to just because um, I've said a few times and I'll continue saying how you do anything is how you do everything. And, and that's how if you're involved in doing well in sports or Greek life or or drama or, or instruments, whatever it is, it shows that you're balancing time. It's being a student athlete or uh, being involved in the drama or anything, having internships, having jobs are super important. And make sure to stress that in an interview. And, and when you go on an interview, that's very important to talk on. 
Ken, Ken Betts got disconnected. He's going to try to come back. Um, there's another question in the chat. If you have another second, Anthony. Yeah, definitely. Ken Betts, come back. I will. So, def so getting a foot on. So, what I would say is for me, uh, and and the one thing I'll learn is, I didn't really know all the different jobs and. There were possibly times that I didn't apply to internships because I wanted to do banking. I wanted to do sales and marketing. I would say any spot that you could start in these companies, I highly recommend you take advantage of it. Don't. It's important you know what you want to do, but never feel like an opportunity is necessarily, not necessarily below you, but not exactly what you want to do because you don't know. Uh, so I would say any opportunity you get, definitely take and, and do a great job in it. And building your resume, I'll start with the GPA. That's definitely important. You want to have a strong GPA. You definitely want to have involvement in your community. I went to Peoria, Arizona through Habitat for Humanity with FDU. That was a great experience. Um, being involved in the community, being involved in the school. The, all of those things are incredibly important. Internship experience is very important, but these companies want to know that who you are outside of your nine to five or your internship. All of those things are so incredibly important. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. We're so incredibly proud of you for all the success that you've achieved, but also, like I said, for being here with our students and sharing your email and sharing your LinkedIn and really wanting to help them. And, and guys, he really means it. So please email him or connect with him on LinkedIn. This is yeah, true. definitely. And if there's anything you didn't feel comfortable asking in front of the audience, please ask me directly. I'm more than happy to, to let you know any way possible. I'll, I'll put it in here again. Okay, perfect, thank you. And, and it's a lot easier now being remote because if I was in the city, it's a little more difficult to get to, to Madison or, or Teaneck, but being remote, I don't care how busy you are, you can always find 20 minutes for someone that, that's looking for help. So I will always, always find time for anyone that has a question. So please feel free to email. Uh, LinkedIn, and I'm very, very happy to help any way possible. Thank you. You're a rock star. Amazing. Hey, I wouldn't be here without uh, without your help, so I appreciate yeah. everything. Thank you. Thank you. We got one more qu uh, thoughts on the current recovery of the economy. So the economy is it's interesting because I don't think we have any idea where it's going. It's uh, how often this is. We've had highs on the Dow the last few months in a row, and is it going to continue to grow? Continue not to grow? It's an incredibly tough question. I think it probably is a little bit overinflated, to be quite honest. It's um, every time I check, the Dow's growing. That can't possibly be always. Um, so I think there is a chance of a slight recession, but I think uh, I think we're in a pretty good spot. I don't. Uh, the good thing is, is the last few recessions, there were reasons for them. So 2008, there was a reason for that that the banking industry took on massive risk without controls and got incredibly greedy. And people were able to get mortgages for a million and a half dollar houses with $30,000 salary. Now there's controls in place that prevent that exact thing from happening. Uh, we had a recession last year because the world went from being 100% open to closed overnight, but we bounced back. So I think it'll, I think it'll always be over time that the over time growth will always be there. Could we bounce back for a year or two years possibly? But I think the, the, the overlooking outlook is pretty good. So I think that's why once you guys start your careers, make sure you match your, your retirement of whatever the company's given you. That's free money. Like I said, I, I like free money. Um, and, and that's really, that is a very good question. I think the economy, I think it's a good economy, but we'll be interested to see. Absolutely. Um, and just want to plug market updates today at four o'clock. Anthony's been joining and uh, if anybody is interested in free, we have a special guest. This is a great day. We had Anthony at 2.30 and we have Ryan Urban at 4 on Markets Update. So oh, great. the lining of Zoom, of COVID is Zoom. Yes. We have these two great guest speakers if it wasn't for Zoom. So uh, silver lining. Anthony, thank you again. We're going to send you a little thank you gift. So just um, text me your address. But um, oh, Thank you very much. I appreciate yeah. that. And I really look forward to, to connecting with everyone over LinkedIn and on emails. And if we're ever allowed to hopefully grab a drink in the city or coffee. I'm always happy. My new office will be in Midtown. So if you're ever in Midtown, please let me know. Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks very much, Anthony. I really appreciate it. This was great. Thank you very much for your time, guys. And uh, I wish you the best of luck. And, and we'll definitely talk soon.
Absolutely. I almost forgot the wheel. After every PDP, we spin the wheel and one lucky student gets a prize. Oh. Go ahead, Jeremy. Is Ross here? Good. He raise his hand. Okay, Ross, you just have to um, type Pat Wire your um, your address. Do you have Pat Wire's email, or you can send it to Ken Betts? Are you in Ken's class? Yeah, Ross is in my class. All right, good. So he'll send it to you. Perfect. Congratulations, Ross. And please scan the QR code for suitable points. Thank you. And anybody, uh, can you hear me, Mary? We just can't see uh, you. All my class, if we can go back to the class for a few minutes right now uh, to the Zoom link for the class, I'll, I'll meet you there in a couple minutes. Right. I'll drop it now, guys. Thank you very right, much. Thank you. Good Bye. Bye, everyone. I hope to talk to everybody soon. All right. Bye. Thanks, Anthony.